just to introduce myself, I'm Bianca Peterson. I'm from the Northwest University in South Africa in, on the Potsdam campus. And um, I did my PhD in molecular biology. And this is where this talk originated from. I presented this at, at a conference uh, in 2017. Um, and I've realized that there is a great need for training in genomics skills. So um, I want this to be a, a, a discussion between all of us. So I won't be doing, a, I'm, I won't be sharing the presentation on screen now, but um, the link is in the etherpad and Angelique also posted it in the chat. So you're welcome to have a look there. Um, the theme of that presentation was teaching people how to fish. So the idea behind that title was that if you send your data to bioinformaticians or companies, um, to do the data analysis for you um, and with data analysis i'm referring to next gen sequencing data if they do it for you you never learn how to do it yourself and that is like giving someone a fish it will feed him for a day but they will need to come back for more when they are hungry and the same with the analysis but if you teach them how to fish if you teach people how to analyze the data themselves then you build capacity and that is the idea of the carpentries as well is to build computational skills capacity. Um, so do, who of you have done big data analysis, um, specifically in GS? Or are you interested in doing that? A little bit, Belinda, Janetta as well. Um, so we, Toby yeah. has a green sticky here in the chat, so he agrees as well. Yes, and Abhinav? Not sure, okay. So, um, so I just want to share um, the initiative we had at our institution to try and build capacity. Um, so in 2015, Arnold of an adult, many of you might know her, she's really um, active in the carpentry. She's also a trainer. Um, she started a study group at the Northwest University to assist students and supervisors with NGS analysis because they came to her for some help. She has background in that. Um, she's done that for, I think, 14, 15 years at that time. Um, and she realized at that stage that we did not get any formal training at our institution, not in undergrad programs or even postgrad programs. So the students and the supervisors were at a loss. They didn't know how to analyze the data. Um, for my PhD, we decided on an NGS project. At that time, I didn't have a clue what it was, but I said, yes, let's do a PhD. And both me and my supervisor did not know what to do with the data. Um, so anyway, so um, the study group that she started, they met bi-weekly. It was an informal meeting bi-weekly for two hours where they kind of exchanged ideas and told each other about the project and how they analyzed the data at that stage. And then she decided to, to host the first software carpentry workshop at our institution. So that was in November 2015. Um, or was it December? November, yes. Um, so then we did a software carpentry workshop where we covered Unix, Git and R. I, I was a participant and I felt completely lost. I cried on the first day. I cried because R was so difficult. I did not understand a thing. and. I thought, okay, well, I just have to get someone to analyze my data. There's no way I'm going to do this myself. So in any case, after the workshop, the study group continued to meet every two weeks and they went through the material of software carpentry. So they kind of did a recap and just went through it more slowly to make sure that everybody could understand it. Um, so it was a post workshop learning environment, if you can mention it or call it like that. Um, so then two months later, um, it was early 2016, and um, the people in the study group decided to enroll for the um, Coursera Genomics Data Science special, um, Specialization. Um, they refer to that as MOOCs, that's an open online courses. So Coursera is only one platform, and there are several others. I will post them in the other pad. Um, if I can just quickly think it's Get Smarter is another one, and I think edX is also one. Um, um, I think there's another one. Data Camp has a lot, but I know the carpentry don't, don't endorse them anymore because of something that happened there, violation of code of conduct. And, um, but yes, so Coursera is also one platform, but there are so many free online learning tutorials available. You don't even have to 
by a STEM student, especially for all. Uh, we enrolled for this specialization and we finished one module per month and we came together every two weeks for two hours and we discussed that module and if somebody had some trouble finishing the module we helped each other so that was really great working as a group we didn't feel so isolated and helpless so in april 2016 i attended the first uh, carpentries instructor training at my campus and I certified later that year. Um, and I think it was August 2016, no, it was later, September or, or October 2016, I hosted a genomics data carpentry workshop at my institution because I knew there were so many people like me who didn't know how to analyze this data. And we invited Jason Williams from the DNA Learning Center of Cold Spring Harbor to be our main instructor. So it was really amazing to teach those foundational skills at that first workshop. And that was my first time teaching in, um, the introduction to R. It was amazing. Um, I also attended a summer school in August 2016, um, which is hosted by, the, by CoData and RDA. It's a joint initiative. I will also post a link to that. It's a two week school where they teach um, open science, research data management, and data science skills. So that is Unix, Git, or or Python, um, as well as machine learning and neural networks. So it's really, it, it goes from the start, like how you collect your data, everything up until publishing. It's really an amazing summer school. And we will be um, hosting a, an online summer school next year. We are currently planning that potentially for May 2021. So I want to share all these resources with you guys, if you know of people that would want to attend this to learn these basic skills. Um, so um, just to come back to the NGS. So, you know, we are, we are living in an environment that's constantly changing. The technologies are advancing so quickly. And for people like us in life sciences, we don't get that formal training in computer science or programming, but we need to know how to analyze big data. Even if it's life sciences, we work with big data. Um, so, and one way of learning these skills we, is to attend workshops. But to do that, you need funding, and there's not always funding. And with the current pandemic, you can't go to workshops, but at least we can do online. But all of us know it's difficult to attend like a five to ten day full day workshop with summer school at the moment. Um, so we, and then most institutions don't have permanent bioinformaticians. I know that we don't have one at our institution. Um, so we rely on postdocs that come to our campus. Hopefully they know how to do this. And then they work on projects, but when they leave, there's still no capacity and that's not sustain sustainable. So that is why the study group try to learn these skills so that we can build capacity so that when the postdocs leave, the senior students will know how to do this and then they train the junior students. And in that way, the supervisors also learn in the process. Um, but after workshops, I've also seen, after carpentry, carpentry workshops are amazing and people feel so empowered, even with the summer schools. And then when they go back home, they feel so isolated and they don't necessarily have the resources to continue with the analysis. So they, they are not familiar or they don't know if they have infrastructure like an HPC, um, a cluster or a cloud or those types of platforms that you need to analyze big data and they feel completely lost. And they don't have the support, especially if you have, if let's say I'm the only one attending a workshop, I go back home, there's no support because my peers did not attend it with me. It's very difficult. And I'm, I tell you this from experience because I was the first one to attend and I did not have that support. So Analda really helped me a lot in that regard, pushing me to learn new things and I will forever be grateful to her. Um, and then the other thing also is that sometimes there are resources available, but we are just unaware of them. And that is really a pity. Like I was looking at Amazon, like AWS, and also the CHPC infrastructure that we have in South Africa. But I didn't even know that we had a local HPC on our campus. Like, I did not know about that. Only the engineering people knew about that. And maybe the computer science, but I don't even think they did. I think only engineering used the cluster. 
I, I wasn't aware of that because I'm from life science. So, so I just want to recap. So what worked for us? It was attending a carpentry workshop in the first place just to get the basic skills. And I mean, all the material is online for free if you want to work through it yourself. But with now with the online carpentry workshops, it's so easy to attend a workshop. You don't have to travel, you don't have to pay. Um, it's really nice. And then the MOOCs, um, the Massive Open Online Courses. As I said, I will paste those um, platforms there, but Coursera is one of them. Um, and then study groups. Don't underestimate the power of study groups. Just meeting informally for an hour or two every week or every two weeks, even if it's online now, just discussing like, I'm struggling with my code, I'm trying to do this in R. And then somebody else might say, oh, I read this in, in some tutorial, let me send it to you. Just that little bit of help, it really helps a lot. And then, as I said, open lessons and training material on the internet, there's so much. And I mean, if you post to the Carpentry's mailing list, people are so happy to share resources all the time. That's all you need. And then it's a great idea to, to partner with other institutions such as e-research. Um, they can tell you about resources such as an HPC that you can use and also they might provide training on how to use it as well. Um, and Mozilla Science Lab, um, they supported us with a study group initially. Um, we continued by ourselves later on, but they have this whole study group handbook. I will also paste that in the etherpad in a minute, um, where they tell you how to make a website um, and how you can run study groups. There are several formats. We called our study group um, Hacky Hour, Genomics Hacky Hour. Um, but afterwards, when I read the description, it wasn't applicable. Like Hacky Hour is when you meet like at a bar or a pub or something for an hour and just informally discuss. But we, we had like two hours, everybody with their laptops. I usually baked cupcakes or muffins or something, you know, to just to keep the morale up. But yeah, that's that's what we did, and that's what worked. But yes, um, it does not. It's not a substitute for formal training in curricula on campus. I know that, but um, nobody ever said that you aren't allowed to to learn stuff through self learning. You don't have to always get formal training. You can do self learning. So that's just in short what we did. You're more than welcome to email me. My email is in the etherpad if you want to discuss this more. But now I want everybody to, to chime in and tell us what you did, what you're trying to do, what your challenges are, or maybe what solutions you might have to challenges that you had. So I want everybody to please chime in. Yeah. Okay, so I am part of a uh, molecular biology, microbiology group. Um, so I study um, bacteria that live on plant roots for my PhD at the moment. And I'm lucky because my research group has a bioinformatician um, and we have our own servers, which is awesome. Um, we have an e research team at my university. And we have a Carpentries uh, institutional membership. And I've been a Carpentries instructor for a year and a half, I think now, um, uh, for R. And for my research project, I, uh, I'm using a bioinformatics pipeline that someone else created to analyze um, genomics data for my bacteria. Um, so I had external sequencing done and then they sent me back the, um, the NGS data. And then I ran it through with the help of my bioinformatician to write a script to get it into a format that I could stick it into this pipeline. And then it sped out the other end, some spreadsheets and things. And then that's what I'm trying to figure out. What does it mean? So the, which is why I said a little bit of experience, not, like I, I'm not doing, I'm not creating my own pipeline or um, even having to figure out which pieces of software to use to analyze because I just use this pre-existing block of software that someone else created. Um, but I'm interested in 
how do you do it if you don't have a pipeline? So my specific type of sequencing that I'm using is a specific named technique um, where you need these kind of input sets of data from your wet lab experiments um, and then that will run through this pipeline. But if I had to do other types of genomics data analysis, I wouldn't even know where to start. Uh, so I'm, I'm conscious that I have genomics experience, but not in a way that I think would be applicable to any other kind of sequencing data. It's only this particular type of sequencing data that I know how to do. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in how do you build up a group. Now we're lucky, um, lucky at my university, we have an R users group. Um, so we have a, a Slack workspace and a monthly little two meetings a month where we have one of them is a, a help session so you can just go along with a problem and say i'm trying to do this thing and i don't know and someone can maybe help you i'm not sure uh, and then another one the other meeting in the month is uh, a workshop which is it's a volunteer run thing and everyone's volunteering to present at that workshop uh, and we cover everything across the entire campus um, like all all faculties are part of that users group so definitely not genomics specialized at all <laughs> so because i'm in a group that does a bit of genomics and omics work in general there are like you say there are some senior people in the group um well, we have a bioinformatician so that's i mean that's probably more than a lot of other groups have um, he tends to be a bit prickly, so I don't tend to go there for help a lot. <laughs> uh, so I tend to try and figure stuff out myself until I get really stuck. And then I have to say, look, I've tried these eight things. <laughs> now what do I do? Um, uh, yeah, so my supervisors have a little bit of experience with genomics and things that they've done in the past, but I don't know if they keep up to date with all the most recent things. And then we have some senior people in senior postdocs, for example, who know things and then we just get some advice from them if we want to do something so i'm interested in figuring out how to build my own personal knowledge of genomics data analysis but then also how do you, how do you how do you structure it like how do you do it on an institutional level rather than just me sitting in my office trying to figure it out and bashing my head against the desk and it's not doing what I want it to do. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my story. Um, so can I respond to that first before we go on? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so the genomics data science specialization on Coursera for me was really one of the best learning opportunities, but it really helped for me to have done the carpentry workshop first just to get that introduction to Unix, that was really amazing. Um, so that specialization actually used Python and not R. So it was kind of like I learned Unix and Git and R, and now I had to learn Python as well. Um, but the specialization, the first module was general like introduction to biology, actually. Um, and then the second module was Galaxy, if I remember correctly. Galaxy is a graphical user interface program you can do proteomics in that, um, and I, I think you can do metagenomics, but I didn't use it for that. Um, but there was, it, you get a whole project that you need to run through. You get sample data, and you have to do this whole mini project. And that was really helpful. Um, it wasn't just theoretical reading stuff, seeing a slideshow. You really had to do like an assignment and submit it, and it was graded. Um, and then, I remember the fourth module. The, okay, the third module was Python, and I struggled with that. I had to do additional like Python for dummies, just to kind of get the introductory Python module because the introductory module was already too complicated for me. So I finally managed to do that. The funny story: it took me like four hours to figure out in Python you have to like say what the file open or something open and give it a handle. I didn't know that. Like they only. Um, talk about the analysis part and when i try it on my part it's not working because the file is not open yet so when i finally <laughs> stumbled upon the solution on the inter internet i literally yelled yay in the office and my phd colleague was like oh did you finish your assignment i'm like no i opened the file and she's like 
what do you mean you opened the file? <laughs> like you've been sitting here the whole day, you just opened the file, like <laughs> uh, getting the <laughs> getting the data into it to the point that you can use it is uh, the hardest thing. <laughs> All right. Exactly. And I said, like, don't judge me. Coding is hard, okay? If you haven't learned it yet, I'm trying my best. It's just scary, really. It went much better. <laughs> I realized I just had to Google a lot and read dummy manuals. I'll get there. Um, so the fourth module was the best one, and that was command line tools for, I think, was it for genomics or something. But that really focused on Unix. And I tell everyone, if you really want to get into this, learn Unix and learn it good, learn it well. Because if you can do Unix, you can work with any like, uh, text file. And that's what sequencing files are. It's basically a text file. The FASTA headers have the greater than symbol and some identification. And the second line is letters of ABCT, and you have to generate basis as well. But I mean, it's still letters. So one piece of advice that a friend gave me is to look at your data through like a computer scientist eyes. Like don't think of it as sequences, look at it as text. Mm. And that really helped me to learn to deal with data. I'm not looking at the actual data, thinking in terms of sequences and diversity and composition and things like that. I was like, okay, what am I looking at? It's, is it numbers? Is it letters? What is the structure? Is there a format? Um, is there a position? I was looking at that. And that really mm -hmm. helped me to start writing the script. So if you then- so It's kind of like all, pausing, yeah. like pausing the biological part of your brain and being like, yes. stop thinking yes. about what it means. Just Look at what's actually in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that really helped me a lot since then. So, and then if you try um, with, let's say, just take two samples instead of 70, take two, try and analyze those two step by step, but run like fast QC to do quality control. Run fast QC, look at the output, like open the file, look at every step that you do, look at the output. Um, don't just run through the pipeline to get to the end. Look at the the intermediate files that really helps a lot to see how the program changes the format or the structure of the file that's really important especially with any omics where you can use there are so many programs like really so 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 many programs and you can use any combination there is not one single pipeline that's the thing there's no mm. right pipeline. you can combine several different programs but you need to know what format that program expects your input file to be like, right? and you need to know, okay, if the output file looks like this, and I want to use this program next, how should I reformat this so that it's um, applicable? What do you say? Um, compatible. To make it compatible for the next tool that you want to use. So that fourth module, um, it was, I will also paste that, it was command line tools. And I'm sure it can be, it, it will be a standalone module as well. It was really, really nice. Um, and then, of course, if you can do that on your laptop, just using two samples, you get the idea of how it works. So usually I run it interactively in, on my laptop, and then I try to put that in a bash script. For me, that was the next step, writing a small little bash script that does exactly the same that I just did interactively in the terminal. If the bash script works on those two sequence files, I know, okay, good. Now you can move to HPC or Amazon or something. You need to upload your data there. You need to get your script up there and you need to make sure the software that you need is on there. And then you run your script on all the files and then it should work. And then you download the results again. So I know some people just work in the cloud, but for me, that was how I, I it was my baby steps going from two files with interactive running in the terminal to a small little script going to, to the cloud platform. And that is how I learned. Um, and now I can actually do metagenomics or well, at least metamarketing. Um, that's what I'm currently doing. So yeah, I think, I, I think I've mastered at least enough skills to be able to help myself. Whereas in my PhD, I didn't know a thing. Um, and just uh, one more thing. If you work with microbial data, you can have a look at CHIME 2. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but CHIME 2 I've heard of it, but I, yeah, I haven't used it. Well, CHIME 2, um, let me just paste the name in the chat quickly. It's weird spelling. CHIME 2 is really amazing. So 
Um, initially, the postdoc that was at our institution with some bioinformatics skills, he in E looked at CHIME, just CHIME 1. There was no CHIME 2 at that stage. Um, and it worked really well. And he started teaching the junior students. And then I, I invited um, Sonia from uh, Minnesota to come and do a genomics uh, carpentry workshop. And we extended it to four days. And I can't tell you how many people are really interested in that. They want to learn how to analyze their own data. Um, and then um, literally, like on the second day of the workshop, they released time two. Just like after we prepared all the material for time one. <laughs> So we just finished the workshop with that and I said, well, sorry guys, but now you have to go and look how uh, time is time two is different from time one, but this 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 the uh, um the principles will be the same. But time two is really user friendly, I can tell you that. I use time two for my initial part of my workflow, and then I use BLAST to identify my sequences. So that's my current workflow. Data two method in time two and then BLAST. But I use the mountain blast, and that's where Unix comes in once again. Um, I really hope that anything I'm saying is useful to any one of you. So, anyone else want to share some stories? Oh, I see Abhi Nav CD, um, that I is also there. I think that they're going to work hey. by Eden for hey. Dynamics. Ah, you want to share? Yeah. Yes, good. Yeah, so, uh, hello. Uh, there, was a, there was some connection problem back there. Um, Earlier, uh, so I'm uh, I'm I'm going to start my master's studies at uh, Ghent University uh, in September, and I did my bachelor's in bioinformatics. And uh, between these two things, I was uh, doing uh, some of the complex uh, modeling for uh, schizophrenia and uh, correlating it with the. Uh, 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 Discovery Studio results and Schrodinger Glide results to to be able be, uh, to be able to find out about some uh, some new potential therapeutic targets and uh, uh, so uh, my background of bioinformatics came from when I was in uh, high school so there was a uh, there was an optional subject uh, that we have to take in India. Uh, along with physics, chemistry, and mathematics. So the optional subject was, uh, it was just introduced in India, biotechnology. So uh, there was a fifth chapter in that book. So the fifth chapter was about 15 to 20 pages, and uh, it was bioinformatics. So I got really fascinated with it really early on. So I did my bachelor's in that only, and uh, now I'm gonna do my master's, and I'm thinking about doing a PhD, but I. I'm not sure like what would be the best in these uh, in these in this current scenario. So, and uh, my bachelor thesis uh, was uh, uh, that we have to do gene expression studies uh, on prostate cancer uh, uh, using three DNA repair pathways, um, and uh, we found some of uh, some 12, 13 uh, targets. The paper got published, so it was my first experience like publishing a paper. So, so my informatics is really cool, I think. Yes, it is really cool if you can do it. Um, it's, it's frustrating as well. Sometimes I struggle like three hours to write a single line of code, but once it works, it makes my life so much easier because I would have taken maybe like an hour to do it manually. And there's this nice graph that the carpentries have in one of their lessons. Um, it, it says geek versus non-geek, but I don't want the terms to be offensive to anyone. But it says like the geek and the non-geek will start both. Um, so the line, let me just do my reverse. So the lines go up and it's complexity on the x-axis. Like the more complex the, the task is, the more time it takes. Time is on the y-axis. So, both start out manually and then the geek gets frustrated doing this manually and he spends a lot of time so it goes vertically upwards it's, it's just it takes a lot of time even though the task is not that complicated yet it, it takes time to to write a proper script but once it works it goes like this it's like you can run the script it doesn't matter if it's two samples or 200 samples the script works on all of them so it's just like it's done 
but the, the non-geek will continue manually. And, you know, at one point, like, laugh at the geek, like, haha, I'm almost done. You're still writing a script, spending hours on one line of code. But once it works, it really, it helps. You can scale that. And, you know, I agree. It's really cool, but it's also frustrating. I, I literally spent three hours once on one line of code, and that was to retrieve um, coordinates automatically from country names. I spent three hours on that, but I'm really happy I did. I've been using the script over and over again. Yeah. But yeah, it sounds really cool. I just want to ask Abhinav, did you, did you um, just read publications to see which software to use for your gene expression? Um, or did you know that already? Yeah, yeah. Just, just read no. No, um, I've read a lot of papers. Like first time, um, my supervisor told me that we have to use uh, Geo2R and Multi Experiment Weaver we Web MEV, and then we, uh, in the process of doing the bachelor thesis, we developed uh, our own pipeline. Uh, the name is uh, I have to type in chat W W B B E G S. So it is within between uh, differential uh, differentially expressed genomic analysis genomic analysis so uh, actually the lab he was uh, working with was at a different university uh, tel aviv university at israel so uh, the uh, we were two uh, two guys in projects so we contributed in developing uh, some of the pre-processing uh, algorithms and some standardization for applying it to uh, cev files and the soft files uh, so we did we did that and uh, then we compared the results uh, of the three different softwares and then we correlated it on the path level and then we got the uh, 13 13 uh, genomic entities for the prostate cancer yeah i must be honest like it sounds a bit complicated to me but um yeah you have to really do your own work and know your stuff to, to be able to write workflows like that. I'm really in yes. awe of people that can just write workflows. It, it takes me a long time to figure out what to do. I, re, I, said, I, I read a lot of papers to see what people use for the step. And when I see one that is used most, I, I kind of figure it out how to use it. And then I use it and I'm like, okay, it's, it's pretty cool. I finally get it. Um, yeah. Janeta or Tabby, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I could, uh, um, in many ways, I can relate to many of the things that you've said. Um, I'm, uh, I actually did two and a half years as a bioinformatician after my PhD uh, at the Bioinformatics Support Unit. Now, um, I, w the first thing I found, though, was um, that uh, what I did a master's in bioinformatics before, and then my PhD was in neuroinformatics. But when I started working as a bioinformatician, nothing I learned before related to anything I was going to do. So um, your coursework just teaches you to think. It does not teach you how to do the job. Um, and uh, I think I've never been so out of my depth for so long. And I, I've got a computer science background. Um, so the other thing I discovered, and this I discovered on the masters, is that uh, biologists and and computer scientists obviously think quite differently. Uh, computer scientists, one plus one is always two, but a biologist, one plus one, the probability of it being two is good. You know, there's a probability of it being two, but and that was that I found was what made it difficult for. Um, biologists to basically grasp the the computer science concepts until they I think you you explained quite well you got to this point where you started looking at the data not as uh, as um, nucleotides but as a and F just plain characters um, because then you can start thinking of it as uh, you know, literally one plus one is two always because that's the case with the computer um, and yes, uh, I think also it depends on very much on uh, on what direction of uh, bioinformatics you're going to work in because there are there are no there's proteomics there's metabolomics there's whatever omics you want to think up and 
uh, want to make up and can think of. And if you learn the one, you don't necessarily know any of the others. Um, uh, my work was mostly focused on differential expression analysis. Um, but that doesn't mean I know anything about proteomics or any of the tools that they use. And um, so, yeah, I think a lot of what you do depends on um, where you land when you start applying uh, the stuff. The, uh, the last thing I, uh, I think, and I very much agree with, agree with you, is that there's, there's quite often no continu continuity with tools. Uh, people will build something, then they leave because postdocs hang around for five years, if you're very lucky. Otherwise, it's one or two or three years. Um, and uh, I don't know uh, if it's a thing yet in South Africa. I now work as a research software engineer at the Newcastle University. And the, the whole idea of that is to actually teach also people from humanities and biology and so on to start using tools like Git to make it more permanent and more accessible for future people so that we have something to build on. Um, so I think that's a big thing to uh, get people to to start using and that's where carpentry of course is amazing because uh, I, i'm also working with a group of engineers and engineers are not although i i kind of thought of them also as technical people they're not computer people they stick everything into a million different directories for every version for everything there's a directory rather than using git and it's it's a battle to convince them to use uh, to use git so um yeah, well, that's my story. I just thought I'd share those <laughs> thoughts. Yeah, no, um, I mean, I'm really envious of people with computer science or bioinformatics backgrounds. I feel like, why did I learn this so late in my life? Um, um, but everybody has their own path, and I always believe that everything happens for a reason. There's a reason why I had to go through all of that, maybe to help other people. Like if, if you feel lost or helpless, maybe my story can inspire someone to really learn. You know, if you, if you felt helpless before, maybe you have some hope. You can see I'm blonde. And so if a blonde can figure out some command line tools, then anyone can, right? <laughs> so, um, I did paste some links to the online learning platforms um, in the Etherpad. It's online 42. So feel free to have a look at those. Um, I know I'm not very familiar with the rest, but I know Udemy is, is quite cheap. Um, Coursera is more expensive, but I know that you can do some courses on Coursera without paying, but then you don't get the certification. So sometimes I do some random modules just to learn something new without getting the certificate because I don't need to show everybody what I know. It's just for me to learn so that I can get better at what I do. Um, yeah, anybody else want to add something else? Any resources or pointers or maybe if you have some questions, Toby, please. Okay, thanks everybody for sharing. Um, I everything that you were saying about your painful experience of trying to learn how to do things in bioinformatics is bringing back a lot of memories for me from about 10 years ago when I started doing my, well, I was already in the middle of my PhD 10 years ago now, how time flies. Um, I can echo most of what Bianca said, so I won't repeat it. Um, I think the, let me start from the beginning, I suppose, say a little bit about who I am. So I, I work at least for the next couple of weeks still, I work at the uh, European Molecular Biology Lab in Heidelberg in Germany. Before that, I did my PhD in a few years as well as a like core facility service bioinformatician at the University of York in the north of England, uh, UK. So. When I moved to Germany to start this job, uh, I started as a sort of like a community manager, I guess, um, managing a, a project for building a bioinformatics community, a computational biology community at EMBL. Um, 
and uh, supporting that community as well. So, and one of the main things that we do to support that community is provide training. And the reason for this being that um, there's this constant demand need even for this kind of training that you've talked about. And Embel takes, I think, a very healthy attitude that all the PhD students that they're training, pretty much every PhD project in molecular biology these days involves some element of, of data analysis. I think that's almost unavoidable at this point. Um, and they want those students to be in control of or responsible for every single step of that project. So they might not actually do the things like press the big green go button on the sequencing machine, but they need to have at least understood all of the steps in that process to get to the point where they've generated their data and then again afterwards they should perform their own analyses rather than letting somebody else do it because it's a fundamental part of the research process and it's not you know the point of a phd is to train you to be a research scientist or at least that's what Emble would like all of their phd students to end up being um, as much as we know that that's probably not realistic in the long term. Um, and it's difficult to believe that you can be a sustainably be a research scientist if you have no idea about what goes on in the bioinformatic element of your research, because that bioinformatic element is only going to increase, I think, um, over the coming years. So Anyway, that means that we do a lot of this training. And what we found is the most effective way to do it is to focus instead of running training courses on specific bioinformatics methods, um, we focus all of our attention on building this capacity and these fundamental skills that Bianca mentioned as well, um, of the, the kinds of things that software and data carpentry teach. Because with this idea that if you get comfortable working on the command line and if you get comfortable with the terminology around all of that kind of thing for example then you can apply your scientific knowledge and understanding of what it is that you're trying to do and find the tools that are appropriate for that job and be able to use them because you're comfortable in that environment um, and a big one of the recurring themes in what you've all been talking about is this um sense of uh frustration i guess and almost um uh i don't know feeling like you're somehow um failing perhaps because you're finding a lot of this stuff confusing and frustrating and things are taking you a long time and i think that one of the biggest benefits of attending a carpentry's workshop or any of the courses that i'm responsible for at embol um is that we make clear that if you're spending 90% of your time trying to understand what's going wrong and fix it, then that actually is bioinformatics and that actually is programming. You know, um, that's what we spend most of our time doing. So if you feel when you're in the middle of that frustration, like that somehow means that you're bad at this and that everybody else doesn't have that problem. And so you should just give up. Then remember that we all still have that problem now. Um, and we very much still had that problem 10 years ago when we were the people or speaking for myself when I was the person learning this. So um, keep going. But also the reason why I do what I do is in the hope that we make this a little easier for other people than it was for me when I was struggling through all of that. Um, I'm going to post a couple of links to the Etherpad, if I'm allowed to, to additional resources. The project that I work on at Embol, um, when the lockdowns all started happening and all our sites started closing in Europe um, back in March, there was a big push that included a lot of members of our community towards supporting the researchers who could no longer go into the lab and do their research. Um, and the way that we were able to do that was by providing them with recommendations for where they could go to find online learning resources and things to at least develop their computational skills while they're not able to carry out their what they call wet lab research, I guess. Um, so I'm going to post a list to the link of resources that we put together there, like recommended resources from the community. Um, it's This is not 
It's not to say that any other resources are not recommended. It's just that this is what we managed to collect together in a short space of time. And then I was also recently at one of the meetings of um, the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya initiative, which those of you based in um, in Africa might have heard of. Um, and there I was asked to talk a bit about advice for people who are starting out learning bioinformatics. So I prepared some notes for that that are still in this HackMD that I've posted onto line 55. So that's really, again, there's going to be some overlap between those two, but a collection of kind of advice and resources for, um, for taking those first steps in bioinformatics. But I'm also here to tell you that um, some of the things that you've described as difficult will always be difficult bioinformatics itself is a very wide ranging field right even genetics or genomics has an ex actually describes an extremely large body of work um, and so it's not really realistic to expect that if you learn to work on the command line you're then able to do everything in bioinformatics instantly um, but at least if you've got those skills you should have what you need to then be able to instead only struggle with understanding the scientific aspect of it rather than also trying to understand the the technical um like domain in which you need to work as well uh i'll stop there thank you toby thanks for sharing the resources and that's what we need right um i remember in january this year just before lockdown and everything started um, we hosted the first summer school in South Africa, well, or Africa rather, but it was in South, no, it, no, there was another one, but anyway, it was South Africa. And I remember the one girl said, like, where do you start? Like, there are so many tools and software, where do you start? And my advice to her, also from personal experience, was just start somewhere. Um, I made like the to-do list. So first of all, it's like um, academic because I'm also doing a postdoc fellowship at the moment, so academic, and then volunteer work, so carpentries and the co-data RDA summer schools, my volunteer stuff. And then lastly, I have like a personal wish list. And every time I see something nice, like a tutorial or a webinar or something, I post it there to my personal to-do list. And I try to do at least one thing on each list every day. Like I would do work on manuscripts for academic purposes, do something for carpentries like teach a, a host a teaching demo or something, or just even read a blog. And then for my personal wish list, I would just go to a small tutorial or even just a part of one tutorial, just to learn one new thing. And then I try and incorporate that one new thing when I do data analysis. And um, the way that I kind of forced myself to learn R better after the carpentry workshop was to do everything in R. I decided like from now on, if I want to do something and I know it can be done in R, I will do it in R. It was really frustrating in the beginning. Like a colleague would ask me to just like assign various group numbers to students so that he can divide them into to groups because I don't know the students. So um, it's not quite, you know, it, it's a, a fair division. And I was like, well, I'm sure there's a way to do this in R. I spent quite some time. I know I could have manually entered numbers randomly in Excel. I would have been done in five minutes. I spent some time in R, but I figured out the code and I did it once. So now, whenever he asked me to do this, I just run the code again on this list and I send it back. Um, and it was for the same colleague that I did that one line of code, the geocoding. Um, he wanted to make a nice map for a conference to show where participants came from. So he had a list of countries and the number of participants from each country. And that's all he wanted to show on a map. And I, I decided like, I'm not going to manually put some pins on a map or use open street maps. I'm going to do this in R. So I had to figure out the map part and also the geocoding part. So I spent like two days on that. But now I use it for anything, like how many languages are spoken in countries or in which countries, how many number of, uh, you know, how many people has COVID, you know, because I have the map and I have the numbers and I can do So it's really amazing and can apply to anything. So I really, I decided to do everything in R, my presentations, my calculations, my graphs, everything. And that really forced me to learn R. And like Toby said, um, you want to really focus on the biological stuff. You don't want to struggle with the technical stuff, but through struggling with the technical stuff, I've really come to understand my data much better. 
I realized with the graphical user interface tools that I previously used, I kind of just ran through the process. I know the input and I see the output, but in between, I didn't really know what was going on with the format of the data or how it changed. And since I've been doing this via command line and looked at my files each step of the way, I really learned my data that much better. Um, so yeah, I feel like the, bio uh, the bioinformatic part really helped me to also understand the biological part much better, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, and I mean, I've mentioned that R has this problem of stepping into dependency problems. Um, I think there is an argument that you can add to dependencies equals true when you install packages. So whenever there are dependencies, it will then automatically install them as well. I haven't used that a lot, but yeah. Um, any other questions or comments or things you want to share? Janeta? Sorry, I, I was just thinking this might be a, a good group to ask this question. Um, because of this issue that uh, we, you, you mentioned with R, you have the same issues with Python, for instance, uh, dependencies and things depending on things depending on things depending. Uh, and um, I mean, one of my worst uh, examples was a bioinformatics one where I was uh, doing differential expression analysis. And uh, to the day, I, I, I did this analysis, I think it was March the 19th, 2015. And on March the 19th, 2016, this, uh, this um, scientist came back to me and said, oh, we want to publish now. Can you just give me these figures and stuff again? And uh, of course, this is now a year later. And I did save all my scripts, everything it was in Git. But of course, nothing would run because in that year, every R package mentionable, mentionable, thinkable, whatever, conceivable changed. So, and when I did eventually get it to run, the results were different because, of course, as people update the software, they change the the uh, algorithms, and it all changes. Fortunately, I discovered that I had. That old work on my home PC, on my home laptop, with all the R, old R packages and everything on it. Uh, and I was able to use that to run it again. If it wasn't for that, then I, I, I mean, I would have, I, I don't know what I would have done. I would have jumped off the next highest building or something because <laughs> it, was, uh, it was just so frustrating. So one of the things uh, uh, I'm now starting to use a lot is is docker and i was wondering do, do you guys uh because it seems that most of you are biologists do you use docker do you have any idea what docker is uh do you use it nobody i've heard of docker but i haven't used it no. because i would I've heard of it and people tell me that you should do it but i don't know what it involves and yeah whilst writing things this doesn't seem to be the best time to learn <laughs> 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 well, the, 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 in short, it just allows you to package up everything and uh, into what they call a Docker container and literally packages up your whole Unix environment. So, uh, Bianca, you said it's, uh, you think it's important to learn Unix, which is uh, most of our analysis now is done in Linux, so Unix, so um, uh, that makes makes sense you know i think you can now get windows dockers but i i try not to go near windows uh, with certain things uh so it just packages up in this this whole environment into into this docker um container and you can just uh, take it to another machine and create in what they call a uh, well, it creates an image and then you run it as a container and that container is basically a, a computer but with the whole uh, environment that you've packaged it with, so it will it will it will just run. And um, I I was wondering uh, I was just wondering uh, it might be interesting to run this past a bunch of biologists and see how well they understand it and how well they can 
um, or how easy or difficult it would be for them to adopt it. So, um, um, now, uh, that's my idea. I was just wondering how many people are using it or would be interested in using it. It sounds very sensible, equally sensible as putting everything on Git. Um, so because you always have that problem of, oh, I'm using an old version, I'm using a new version. Um, even when you're just teaching Carpentry's introduction to R, like I'm on a different version to the new students who have just downloaded it and it looks slightly different or something like that. Um, so it makes complete sense to me as to why you would do it. I just haven't invested the time to actually do it. <laughs> so add that to the uh, personal wish list, I think, Bianca. <laughs> Uh, so if I uh, put together a, a carpentry's like, uh, what do they call it? Car mm. Carpentry's like course, which is kind like of a lesson. Yeah. 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 Does something exist already? Is there like a? I mean, might be something out there that could be easily I adapted. Seen, I haven't seen anything for Docker, so uh, ach, for for carpentries. But I've been thinking about it, so maybe I must put something together. And, and I'm sure it's not just biologists. I mean, yes, because this oh, is yeah. about genomics, we're all biologists, but the people yeah. who tell me about it are some are biologists, but some are like from ancient history and uh, yeah, really, no, it, really any analysis you run anywhere, it depends on the versions that you're using and how everything interacts. So yeah, no, um, well, in, in the group that I work now as a research software engineer, we work across all faculties and the whole idea is to give help to people who do not have a computational background. So, uh, yes, it applies to everybody. I just, I, 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 despite my, the fact that I was so out of my depth <clears throat> when I started with bioinformatics, I still have an affinity for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I, and just because that's the audience, I thought I'd ask. Yeah. Um, I guess it would yeah, be a good think... little. It would Sorry. be a good little add-on to run, like if it was a short uh, lesson. Um, you could, I guess, you could run it at our users groups or other hacky hour. Well, Bianca's version of a hacky hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's yeah, it's like if it was a short little lesson that just took an hour or two to run through, then that way you could introduce a bunch of people to it where you don't, didn't have to be a full um, R carpentries or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, I mean, it, it is, it can be quite, can get quite complicated, but I guess one can do an introduction uh, to it all um, in, in, in a hour, two or two and a half hours or so. Yeah. All right. I'll put something together. And then if you guys are interested, you can come and attend. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, definitely. Janetta, um, I would suggest posting to the Carpentries mailing list um, and ask their, and, and tell them what your idea is. And if anybody's interested in collaborating, I think that will also help you a lot in putting material together. I think there are a lot of people working with Docker. Um, and when you mentioned image, I'm like, oh, yes, I do use that. <laughs> um, because Chime, um, Chime makes, uh, there's an installation for VirtualBox if you're using Windows like myself. Um, I install a virtual box, box and then I download a Chime image and all the software that I need is already in that Chime image. So um, I didn't know that is the same as stuff. Is that the same? That I um, not, not, it's like one type of, just one type of it depends on um, what image is it? Is it something like a virtual box or something that you're running? Because yes. Docker Okay, now, so it's not exactly the same. It's slightly similar. Um, <laughs> a Docker, a Docker, a Docker image is much, much lighter than it's much smaller, much lighter than a virtual box. Okay. This is, uh, so the virtual box, you download the image, that, uh, which is a similar concept, but I think the okay. implementation is slightly different. Yeah. So. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, no, is, I think the Carpentries lesson is a good idea. That will help a lot of us. What's nice now is on the on uh, if you have Windows 10 Enterprise, you can run the Docker uh, images, the, even the Linux Docker images. Uh, you can create containers on your Windows machine. I haven't done it, but some of my colleagues have because I mostly work in, in Linux. I've got my Windows machine, but it doesn't have Enterprise, so I haven't been able to do Docker on that. But that's just my personal machine. So um, 
uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, so I'll, I'll do that. I'll contact them on, on Carpentry's uh, Slack channel now. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, I don't know if I've seen you. You said something there is a session on Nix. Um, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, I think it's today. Um, uh, there's a session on the reproducibility uh, version control program. I don't know what it is, but it it is similar to the one uh, the Docker. There is Nix version control. And there are Git version control and there is Docker. So uh, there is one session. I don't know who is who is hosting that session, but uh, there is one session on on that sort of thing on that workflow. Is it part of CarpentryCon or is it just is yeah, there a yeah, session yeah, somewhere yeah. else on the it, internet? No, no, it is a part of CarpentryCon. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I'm surprised I missed that. Yeah, me too. Um, maybe Everyone's it's in the <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's in the incubator. I'm not sure. Um, I know there are many lessons in the Carpentries incubator that are not on the website yet, but it's amazing. You can work through that as well. It's really helpful. And if you, I mean, for Python, I know there's a lot of resources, and of course, the Carpentries also have Python modules. Um, and then for our studio, if you go to our studio's website, they have webinars that they host every now and again, but they're also recorded and you can watch it in your own time. They have these amazing webinars. Um, that has really helped me a, a lot as well. Okay, oh, so is, um, I'm gonna have pasted the link for the Nix packaging. Um, let's see if we can just move that to the Ethernet. Thank you for sharing that. That's um, unfamiliar to me, so I will have a look at that. Um, yeah, anyone else? Feel free to jump in. I just wanna, uh, yeah, I was, I was wondering if I should share this or not, but yeah, I, I think, I think I'm gonna do that. So while I was doing my PhD and feeling helpless, um, when I realized I didn't know how to analyze the data, we got a bioinformatician to actually analyze it. He spent a few months on it, but I don't think he really knew what he was doing. I think so. he, was, he spent like 10 months on it and he resigned without telling me. And I thought he was still analyzing my data. And um, I had a baby and he was like five weeks old. Um, the same baby that kept interrupting a few minutes ago because he has a cold and now he's not allowed to go to school. Um, so in any case, he was five weeks old and I had this NGS data to analyze and the bioinformatician resigned and I was like, what am I going to do? And I went to another department to go and ask for some help because I really didn't know anybody who can do command line and analyze the data. And I ended up at a professor's office and I told her my situation, I'm, I'm in trouble, I need to analyze my data because I really need to finish my PhD. And she said, well, if you don't know how to analyze your data yourself, then you're stupid and you should quit your PhD. Um, and I was like, um, what? <laughs> so, of course, I, I really tried not to cry, but I did start crying because I was really worried, like, am I really going to quit my PhD after like three, four years now? Um, and that's when I met Analda and attended Carpentry and then did Coursera. So um, it wasn't just like, a little help. It really it saved my PhD. Like really, it saved my PhD, and I think it saved myself because um, I wouldn't have been happy with such a huge disappointment in my life, like quitting a PhD three, four years into it. Um, so, as I said, the community don't underestimate the power of community, like the carpentries and study groups. It really helps more than you know. So yeah, I'm glad I didn't quit. Um, it was a long road learning, and um, but it, it can be done. And just reach out. I mean, I was really shy to reach out in the first place, especially after that comment. I didn't want to reach out at all anymore um, because I did feel stupid and I thought I was stupid because how can I do a project without knowing how to analyze my data myself? Um, but it, it happens. I realized, well, life sciences, 
way back when we only had like single sequences that you can do, um, you can blast them one by one and stuff like that because it wasn't a lot of data, but times changed, technology advanced and we need to now um, catch up on the skills. That's just the only way to go. So I've been thinking about running, well, how do we go about running um, Carpentry's R for genomics, whatever it is, I can't remember the name of the course, but the genomics, the new genomics curriculum um, at my institution. So I, I would think that I would run through that course myself, because like I said, I feel like I'm specialised into my particular box and not the generic I don't know, way of doing things. Uh, it might just be a perception of mine. But anyway, running through the course myself and as a, like either in, in a different carpentries workshop with different instructors or like as a learner myself or just do it on my own time. But then in terms of the carpent teaching using the carpentries method, having two, co two instructors all the time, I feel like I might be the only instructor at my institution and my institution because of reasons plus COVID doesn't have money to pay for ex external instructors to come in. So how would you, do you have any, anyone got any ideas of how I would get a second person who, because I don't think we have any other genomics instructors at my institution. Yeah. And Lee, raise your hand. Hi Belinda, I, um, my job in South Africa is kind of your problem, just the whole country. So, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we don't have, it's just we have a handful of instructors who were students and postdocs and they move over to permanent jobs which don't allow them to volunteer. So we are strategically kind of um, offering instructor training workshops to people within our institution. I know if you mentioned you a member organization of the Carpentries, correct? And part yes. of that membership allows you to host X amount of instructor training events in your institution, which means yes. if you can get two trainers together, which I'm sure your institution has, you can train instructors at your institution. So you can have, a, I know that Sadilar and a Northwest University in um, South Africa, we are very strategic in how we are placing our workshops so that this, these gaps are filled. So that's the approach we are taking currently. Current members are actually giving up seats to other universities in South Africa so we can build capacity at universities with one or two instructors. So to kind of, um, I want to say, enable and sustain that movement. So I was a postdoc, my three years are up, which is more or less standard in South Africa, Bianca, maybe I was, a, I can't remember how long my postdoc was. It's just too long ago. And then you move on to somewhere else and then your job's like, sorry, you can't take two days to volunteer your time because of X, Y, and Z reasons. So maybe that's something you can look into. Mm. Yeah, now that you say that, um, we, we only have one instructor trainer at our um, mm. university, but there is another one in Sydney because that's how I did my instructor training um, with them. Um, she, the other, the one from another university is a genomics person. So that's lucky. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity, maybe not, not to start, maybe specific, not specifically my university, but collaborating with another university or another organization in Sydney. Oh, absolutely. Or even now with everything on Zoom somewhere yeah, on um, the, in Australia exactly or New Zealand. Why we're doing <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Thank you. So my five cents. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Angelique. Um, I mean, you can you can build capacity through instructor training, but if you're specifically looking just to host a genomics workshop for participants, yeah. um, I I taught the genomics workshop in December last year, so 2019 December. I taught. Um, I was a co-instructor for the R genomics um, workshop in Kenya. Um, so. We had another instructor there in person. So I oh, yes, I saw the blog post about that, I think it yes. was. Yeah. Yes. So oh, that I, was you. I yeah. It was me, yes. <laughs> so I was sitting in a boardroom on campus. I was still allowed to go, go to campus. I was sitting all by myself with my laptop and my iPad next to me with my notes on. Um, and I was teaching interactively. I taught Unix and 
I think I was I can't remember the Unix and the first part of the genomic session in any case. Um, so that was yeah, so the first part was spreadsheet organization, sorry, and then Unix. And then Uso was the, the other co-instructor in person in Kenya. Um, so he did the venue and he got some helpers. So yeah, and he would just interrupt me whenever people got stuck. Um, so he was my he was my person there. Um, and then the next day he taught the rest of the genomic session. Unfortunately, he was muted and he did not realize it. And I was sending him e messages and emails and everywhere that I had his contact details. But I mean, he was standing in front teaching, so it didn't matter. So I did not hear him teach that whole day, but it's okay. So I would say just you can get in it. Okay? I mean, I'd be happy to, to teach for you if you don't mind, all the way from South Africa. Um, so like Angelique said, now with Zoom, it's so easy. You can get instructors from anywhere because you don't have to fly them into your country. Um, so it's actually easier. Um, the, the only complication now is that the people need data. If they want to attend a workshop, um, and Angelique can tell you more about the instructor experiences, they are trying to do a two full day workshop over four half days. Um, and that seems to be working much better now because people can't sit for two full days. Um, but there was an, a whole session on instructor experiences just um, last week. So uh, was that recorded, Angelique? Yes, the it is. Session. And yes. there is a time zone, I think your time zone friendly, on the 23rd or 24th. We, uh, yeah, I think, I'm, I think I've registered for that. Yep. Yeah, so some, of, yeah, some of the time zones are really not Australia friendly. <laughs> Yeah, I can't do a workshop at 2 a.m. It's just not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that one is midnight South African time. So, or right, 11 so that's PM, about so. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I know we record the session and it will be on yeah. YouTube very soon. I think they're doing it week for week. So it might be released this week. Just right, keep your awesome. watch out on Twitter. The links will come soon. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I'm gotta, I've got an alert on Twitter for all the Carpentry Gone posts. So. <laughs> um, I also was part of a, uh, an online workshop uh, just last week or the week before. Um, my university was teaching um, Shell and Python. So th they did Shell over two mornings and then they did Python over two mornings. I'm not a Python person. So I just, I was a helper with the Shell side. Yeah, so you might see a blog post coming out at some point about that. <laughs> so, yes. Not from me, but from Brian, the uh, host. <laughs> but. <laughs> but, but one way, one way to also build capacity, and that is kind of what our approach was with an alpha. We first did a workshop where people attended the workshop to see what it was about, because they were really like, what is software carpentry? Like, they were so um, skeptic, like, they didn't know what it was. Um, until they attended it, it was like, oh, it's amazing. And then we said, oh, well, let's do instructor training next year. Do you want to become an instructor and teach this around the world or around the country, at least across the country? And then we got instructors. And then as they teach other people, they first attend the workshop and then they become instructors. And that is how Analda has really helped with building capacity in our country. And also the instructor training is also online now. So yeah, I think it's, it's a good time to, to actually build capacity now. But I don't have anything else to add. I mean, I can sit here the whole day. Um, you will have to kick me out. But um, feel free, if you have specific questions, you can, you can email me or actually we'd be happy to, to give feedback. Um, and then I mean, I've just added a comment. I suppose it's similar to the concept of Kaiser Dojo. I'm not familiar with that. Do you want to? You want to say something about that? So, uh, so this is a worldwide organization uh, who teaches kids uh, how to code. Basically, they arrange events and all that. Just how to program, not to fear programming. Ah, okay. So it's similar to what Carpentry does. Yeah, it's a it's a very uh, very old organization, I think. Uh, Go to dojo is for kids. Yeah, yeah. I I run a Go to dojo. Well, I did 
run a coda dojo here near where I live, but it's it's usually for say five to sixteen, seventeen year olds. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, it's just a session where they come and uh, they they uh, you have they call them sushi cards. <laughs> it's a card with uh, like a lesson on that they can work through. Um, and uh, they start with Scratch. You know the programming language Scratch? I don't know if you're... It's a <clears throat> kind of drag and drop of blocks. So they learn to program like that. And then eventually they can move on to Python. They can pretty much do what they want and they work on their own. Um, yeah, but that's Coda Dojo for the, for the kids. Thank you for sharing that. I'm definitely going to use it on my kids because I don't want them to ever go into a world without knowing how to code. <laughs> yeah, it's quite interesting because um, Code Dojo, if they're under the age of 13, then the parents have to come with them. So um, you don't actively teach, you know, you actually just, uh, you give them these cards uh, and then the parents work with them through the cards. So the parents also learn, a lot of the time the parents also come and they know nothing, bad grannies who know nothing. <laughs> they come with the kids, they work through it and they learn computer concepts like that. Yeah. So, um, I want to thank everybody who attended. Um, I really enjoyed it a lot and I am really looking forward to working through all the resources that you shared. Um, thank you so much. And I hope that the session was helpful to all of you. Even if it was one single thing that you take, take home from this, I, I really hope that it helped in any way. Um, but it was nice meeting you online. Um, and I hope to see some of you or all of you someday um, when this pandemic is over. Um, so, and also then thank you, Angelique, for hosting the session. Um, I'm really glad that you hosted this. Um, you are always there to help me when I need you. So um, I'm going to hand over to Angelique to, to wrap up. But thank you from my side and then have a great day or slash evening. <laughs> I'll go. I think I'll clap. Thank you, Bianca. You shared all your wisdoms. And I just love how this resource list grew and grew by the minute and everyone's sharing. And it's really a collaborative event. It's, you might be presented, but you have the whole room full of co-hosts in a sense, right? So that's amazing. Maybe a little tidbit from mind. I'm not a bio mathematician or anything of the sort. I'm from social sciences, a degree in M ed, ed psych, but I had exactly the same problems you had. I came into a PhD and they told me, oh, this latent variable modeling, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that's not done in um, psychology. And I'm trying to um, model a social ecology. Great, let's do this. And suddenly I just had no idea what M plus was and I did not know what all these other terms and errors and stuff is. Oh, but it's regression, you know, they said it's just regression. But I, when I started the carpentries in R and working my way through the lessons, I became more confident in my skills on searching online as well. So I am taking your comments and your feedback and I'm going to translate it into psychology terms and how I can use it in my own research. So I'm taking a lot away from today's session. Just a reminder, I pasted a link to the feedback survey. We would like to hear your comments, your suggestions for future events like this. And again, thank you so much for taking time and sharing your knowledge with us, because this is how we're going to grow the community, is when we really sit down and we discuss it. So that is all from me. I'm going to stop the Zoom recording at the moment, and I hope to see you very soon and all the other, not well, every single one, because time zone differences clearly, uh, <laughs> but in other um, events online and hopefully at the final, I think that we're calling campfire or lightning talk at the end. So I'm really looking forward to a wrap up from our executive director.